Today we're going to cover a couple of things. The first bit is the assignment, the article that you're going to be writing for over the next five and a half, six weeks and submit in week, at the end of week eight. So, first of all, this is where you'll find it in the folder over here, which is called assessments. And that's what you'll see here when you get there. Two items in here. One is the first bit, which is the actual specification of the article, the assignment specification. And most of the assignments you will get over the next three years will come in a format something like this, in terms of the basics, front page, and so on. And then, for this particular assignment, you'll see the folder called Springer LMCS Template. Now, this is a template that many of us here as academics use when we're writing papers to go to conferences and to go to uh, submit to academic journals published through the Springer system. Springer is a big international, mainly academic publisher. And they provide a very, very fixed format that you will get used to. Uh, those of you who are doing BSCIT will be using this Springer LNCS format uh, regularly over the next three years. In fact, in the final year, you'll use it twice, in the second year at least once, um, and maybe in the third year, one of the other uh, uh, modules that I don't teach will also use the Springer LNCS template. Now, one of the reasons that we use a template for you guys is to get you used to writing to certain standards. Those of you doing um, forensic investigations and so on will be using standard templates and formats in your professional life. And many of the rest of you will also, in your professional life, will have to use templates because that's what business says you will do. And they are often very, very strict control, uh, rules about perfect <coughs> compliance with your templates. And so with this assignment, we're going to get you used to that very early on. And through the <coughs> workshops on the Tuesday, I'll be working with you, helping you to understand how to set it up and how to use it. One of the things about templates in Word is they are somewhat unreliable. And so it's useful to get used to the idea of how do you handle one of these word templates because you're going to need to do that in your future. I and my colleagues, academic colleagues, we have to use four, tend to use four, five, six of these things every year. We have very, very strict limits, sometimes page number limits, sometimes it's in terms of word count, <coughs> you name it, they'll give us limits. And if we exceed particular page limits, we have to pay $100 per page over the limit. So there's quite tight, uh, quite strong um, incentives to meet the limits. And so you'll find with this assignment, there are some quite strict limits, which I'll explain to you in a little while. So let's have a look at what the assignment spec looks like. So a very standard heading tells you what it is, what the module is, it tells you uh, how, what proportion of the module grade comes from this, like 50%. So, yeah, that's better. 50% um, of your grade comes from this assignment. The hand-in deadline for this assignment is 5 o'clock in the afternoon on the 11th of November 2016, which is the end of week 8. It also will tell you which of the various learning outcomes for the module is assessed by this particular assignment. And this one is the second one, which is your research, uh, your ability to research for information, evaluate it, 
and interpret the information you get. Some of which may be quantitative, that is numbers. Some of which is qualitative, which is words, opinions, um, and so on, concepts. And what we're going to learn to do is how to create an argument that will persuade your reader that you have got an interesting topic, that your analysis is correct, that it is supported by lots of evidence, that is the sources that you're using, which you show by those citations, which you've been working on over the week through Plato, and that you will use an appropriately rigorous academic approach to presenting those arguments and your conclusions. That's what that learning outcome is all about. So the task. There's this online e-journal called Computers for Everyone, and they want to have an, a series of articles, one from every single one of you here, about the topic of the impact of computers on your life and on our life. You're writing a formal academic article, properly researched, properly cited and with references, which looks at the changes, the advances in computer technology over the last 25 years in a particular area that is of interest to you. Now the four topic areas are, because they are highly relevant to today, is the rise and fall, well the rise and rise of social media and smart devices. The fact that we have these things around us all the time, we're looking at Facebook, we're looking at LinkedIn, Instagram, whichever our chosen social media is, and people are looking at it. 30% of all people apparently service uh, a report yesterday said 30% of people are looking at their smart device at least once in the middle of the night. Now, when most of us are thinking we ought to be getting a bit of sleep, people are checking these and saying, who's contacting me, who do I need to contact, and so on. A couple of topic areas which will spring immediately to mind, but are not the limits. You can choose any area that's interesting to you, but a couple that came to mind when I was putting this together are the impact of these gadgets, messaging, Instagram, and all these other aspects of social media on the way that we actually communicate between ourselves and our network of friends and relatives and people and all those also in business alongside us. Another one is the use of social media like Twitter, like Facebook, like LinkedIn, for businesses to connect to, particularly, their potential clients and customers. How many of you are connected on LinkedIn? And how many of you have noticed that over the last year or so, there are more and more business-sponsored adverts? Fortunately, uh, in the future, according to a report I saw yesterday, there's a new interface coming out for LinkedIn over the next two and a half, three months by the end of this year, which brings all three platforms, smartphones, tablets and PCs, to a more similar type of experience, whether we want it, whether we like it or not. And that's going to make it clearer where the adverts are within LinkedIn, apparently. So a couple of topic areas there. LinkedIn is in the process of being bought by Microsoft, yes, indeed. Uh, I suspect it's not a Microsoft input because it's happened too quickly there. It was only finalised in about May. And looking at the sort of things that are being done, I have a suspicion it's actually a longer term project uh, that's been going on for a while. And we hear that LinkedIn will probably be allowed to stay fairly independent for a while. How long that will be, goodness knows. Uh, and so on. <clears throat> so we got to, I mean, it's going to be interesting to see what happens. And of course we saw in the last three days 
major rumours coming about out about Twitter being sold off to maybe Microsoft or might be uh, Google or or um, one of these uh, Salesforce. I think it was Salesforce.com. I think you're possibly buying it. Denials all around, but it might be interesting to work out why someone big like those, like Google or Salesforce.com might want to buy Twitter. Apart from the fact Twitter is not terribly profitable at the moment and is struggling. The second topic area is the topic area of artificial intelligence, machine intelligence, and cognitive computing. One of the really big areas at the moment, and I'll be going in uh, at the end of October to probably the largest cognitive computing conference in the world. There'll be about 12,000 people there over in Las Vegas for about four or five days. And it is all about cognitive computing. One giant conference. Now the thing about that one is it's sponsored by, run by IBM, sponsored by IBM, and it's about their systems called Watson. Hence the title of the conference is actually World of Watson. And, there's, and cognitive computing is a field of computing which is a little bit like trying to mimic how the human mind works. If you want to get a, a little bit of a feel for what can be done, look up what's IBM Watson and research that. Have a look at uh, Watson Oncology, see what happened there, which is a fantastic machine that they've, that's been developed over the last three or four years. It was came after uh, IBM used Watson Cognitive as a, uh, to play the game of Jeopardy in 2012 or thereabouts, and they won. And the thing that's interesting about Jeopardy is the question that is posed is more along the lines of an answer and you've got to work out which of several questions is relevant. So you've got to reverse the thinking, uh, typically. Cognitive computing is different from machine learning because AI and machine learning tends to learn in some fashion from learning sets of data and then when you present it with a real question, it gives you an answer but it cannot necessarily justify the answer, whereas cognitive computing engines can tell you why they've come to that recommendation, step by step, and give you the confidence levels of those answers. And it's now being you released across the world to provide expert assistance to help desks, whether it's IT help desks or whether it's um, insurance salespeople in a help um, in a sort of big uh, telephone uh, com complex. It can provide all sorts of interesting advice, having been given huge amounts of text-based data. It's also becoming very good at understand, understanding our natural language. Uh, voice to text and text to voice is the very, very foundation of it. A little bit like Siri and all the other um, voices from the smart device manufacturers or operating system manufacturers. And there are all sorts of interesting implications. How does, or how do these systems actually understand natural language? What's it doing to the way that we work, the way that we behave? Do we really have Siri switched on all the time to ask it as our becoming, um, or soon to become, personal assistant, or the equivalent from Microsoft and from Google? So there's a major impact on all sorts of things. Us becoming more and more lazy, perhaps. Maybe we're able to do, be, uh, do our business, do our social interactions more effectively because this thing is listening to us all the time. Well, most of the time, particularly if we said Siri or whoever. Is it good for society? Is it good for business? Is it good for us to rely on these text uh, to voice and voice to text, cognitive engines and natural language understanding. What is going to happen in the next 10, 20 years as more and more people in your position see people in my position using some of these cognitive advisory systems? <coughs> For example, with co Watson Cognitive, Watson Oncology, it contains all 
are the published articles, research articles, about the diagnosis and treatment of cancer. <coughs> it knows, it has ingested every single article that's ever been published and it is updated all the time with all the thousands of articles which are published every week. Now, no human can keep up with that. In a consultation, the consultant or the doctor will, who's connected to this will input or share the details of this particular patient, treatment regimes currently underway, and so on and so on and so forth. Lots and lots and lots of extra data. And Watson Oncology will then make some suggestions on the basis of the most up-to-date information from all of those articles and suggest further lines of inquiry, which are then fed back in by voice. And then it will make one or two recommendations. As recommendations, not as treatment decisions. Now, the interesting point about this is that current consultants who have been treating cancer for the last 20 years of their life have a very, very comprehensive model in their head of all this field of oncology, of diagnosis and treatment. And so they can kind of, with their experience, with their internal head model, sort of calibrate this advice. And say, yeah, I like that bit of advice, it's good, I can go with it. Or maybe, but, and there's a little bit of a but because of something that's not actually already in Watson. Now, the problem in terms of these cognitive advisory systems, and this is why IBM make it absolutely clear to all users of their cognitive engine that these systems are advisory, they are not your decision makers. This goes back to the idea of computing over the last 40 years. Computers are very good at number crunching and coming up with suggestions and recommendations, but Humans must make the decision. So the doctors, the consultants, with their own model, their own experience, will then calibrate what Watson says and maybe follow it, maybe not. Maybe teach it a little bit more about what it doesn't know about. Now the question comes, what happens to the young doctors who, in effect, see the consultant, this very experienced person, agreeing with the recommendations from Watson Oncology almost every time. There is a danger that human beings, because we are all fundamentally, basically, a bit lazy, and it takes a lot of oxygen and hard work to do a logical critical evaluation and decision making, we don't like doing that. We like to make a snap decision or we like to rely on somebody or something else to make the decision for us. So these young doctors may well say, why should I bother to create my own internal head model because what's long college is always going to be there so I can always rely on it to give me the right advice and make the decision for me. And we see this in many, many other areas. We see it in aerospace, <coughs> particularly in one set of air aircraft that have been uh, fly-by-wire almost since they first started, Airbus. And you can find the full uh, story in a book which is called, uh, by Nicholas Carr, called The Glass Cage. And he points out that with the type of automation and control systems that Airbus provides for all of their aircraft, the pilots tend to lose their skills in flying the aircraft properly. Because they have a control set of control systems which say, this is what the plane will do, this is what the plane is going to do, and don't try and override the commands because we won't let you. Un unlike the Boeing set of aircraft, where they take a different view that the control systems is advisory, 
And if you really do need to do a slam acceleration, like zoom, and slam your ex the throttles forward, we'll let you do that. Whereas Airbus will say, oh sorry, you've put the th throttles forward very, very fast, uh, we don't like that, so we'll accelerate the engine a little bit more slowly. Or when an aircraft, Air France 470, I think it was, over the Atlantic, got into a very, very difficult position, the pilot spent more time trying to reset the computers than trying to fly out of the dangerous situation they'd got into. We see similar sorts of things with the way that some of the autonomous cars are being set up. So there's a huge range of opportunity here to explore all sorts of interesting and different topics. And I'll talk to you, with each one of you, over the next couple of weeks as you explore these various topic areas. The third topic is about location services on these sort of things and others which try to track where we are to give us interesting and useful advice, to record where we are. Trouble is, and our third year students for the last couple of years have been doing work with me and for me on the accuracy of location services on these little gadgets. And we are now building the most comprehensive database <laughs> of the accuracy of location services uh, that anyone has actually got. And they aren't very accurate. Well, 85% of the readings that those gadgets t uh, record are accurate to within, <coughs> let's say, 25 meters. The more interesting ones are the single points every now and then, which are 100 meters error, a mile error, 60 miles or 100 miles error. And there's an organization called Think Near from the States who's done a huge amount of work with billions upon billions of, uh, analysis of points being analyzed over each quarter. And they say, and it hasn't changed significantly in the last two and a half years, Think near say that over 10% of all targeted adverts, location targeted adverts, are in error by more than 100, mile, 100 uh, kilometers. <coughs> so a couple of interesting topics here would be things like the changing nature and growth <coughs> of geographical based information systems and the applications that hang off that. And that's a huge raft, some relating to the use of this, and many, many, many other types of application. Or you could look at things like the use, accuracy, and value of location service. Is it worthwhile? What does it do for us? How is it affecting the way that we actually navigate? How many of you, when you're in a, strange, in a familiar place, continue to use your maps like this to give you a uh, turning by turning um, guidance. There's some very interesting research that's been out for the last couple of three months that suggests that if you rely on one of these gadgets or even the GPS sat-nav, particularly if you have the um, direction of travel at the top of the screen, you only use it to, but I'm going to turn left now, or right, or go straight on. You don't build a map in your head, a real live proper map. And that's held in something called the hippocampus. Research shows that London taxi drivers, with their knowledge, which takes them several years to develop, to know every single road all the important buildings in the whole of London. Their hippocampus is something like 25-30% larger than most other people. The evidence seems to be that if you rely totally on your sat-nav or your smart device for navigation, your hippocampus starts getting smaller. And there's a very curious side effect of this. That it affects our ability to remember other things, not just maps. So there are some interesting aspects about using location services and using maps and guidance, rather than the old style 
paper map and so on, where you have to look at it and think about it and build that map. And then for those of you who are more interested in uh, forensics and cybercrime, cybersecurity, <laughs> there is a whole range of interesting new areas that you can incorporate into an article like this about the growth of, the detection of, and the prevention of cybercrime and think how it actually is affecting the real world. And you can connect some of these together. Uh, big data, location, and cyber uh, prevention, and cyber crime prevention, there are lots and lots of applications being built for business, for, by the banks, and by the police, to actually catch criminals who are maybe using your credit card. They've stolen it, or cloned it, and they're using it at ATMs. There's some lovely um, examples of the use of big data analytics and little data analytics to get police at the right ATM to be able to grab the fraudsters as they arrive to extract your money. So four major topic areas, social media, smart devices, AI and machine intelligence and cognitive computing, location services and GIS, and cyber fraud and cyber crime. Those are the four fundamental ones if there's something that's really, really close to your heart, that's not exactly covered by one of those, let's have a discussion uh, next, this coming week on Tuesday and next week, so you can home in onto a, a topic which really excites you and where you can see significant impact on society or on business or on you. You will be submitting the article at the end of the day to Turnitin, which is where we check the similarity with, of what you have submitted with what has already been written elsewhere. It might be academic, academic articles, it could be anywhere on the internet, it could be other assignments submitted to universities around the world. So we will run it through that. And I will open up a, the submission point so you can check your writing to make sure that you aren't copying other people's work. If you remember last week I said, I don't like seeing quotations. They are of no value. They contribute very, very little other than reassuring me that you can do a bit of research. But it's all wasted effort because those words that you copy and paste reduce the amount of words you can write which explains how you think. Now, the limits. Very much like the limits that we have for different articles. I've got to submit over the next few, few days between 300 and 600 words for an abstract. Anything over 600 words will get bounced. Anything under 300 words will get bounced. If I'm wanting to do the next level up, it's between 600 words and 2,000 words. Same applies. Underneath, under, below the limit, bounced, above the limit, rejected, and so on. So for this one, to give you a target in the Springer LNCS format, which we'll talk about in a second or two, and I'll work with you over the next couple of weeks to show you how it works, how you can get it live, you have three pages and no more, and maybe ten lines less. Otherwise, there are severe penalties. That is from the beginning of the introduction line, the header introduction, to the end of the last word of the conclusion. That is three pages plus zero lines minus ten lines. You will also have immediately after that, on the new page, control enter to force a page break. You can have a bibliography of as many as long as you like. No limits on the contents of the bibliography other than it is a list of those sources that you have actually used and cited in your article. And then in front of the introduction are, will be one or two more pages which have the title, a subtitle, your name, University of Derby, uh, your email address, the abstract, and some keywords, and a table of contents. A 
And that can be a couple of pages if you want, but that's not a part of the page limit. The page limit starts with the header introduction and finishes with the last word of the conclusion. Now, sometimes Turnitin has a little fit. Uh, for some reason, it as it works, it produces a PDF and it may get confused and suddenly decide that what was, in your version of the LNCS uh, templated article, exactly three pages of content, it may decide to flow the last two or three lines onto the next page. Do not worry. As long as your Word document, the docx, doc, uh, docm version, which is also stored inside uh, Turnitin, as long as that shows that your writing and formatting finished on the three page limit plus zero, I will put a little annotation which says, Turnitin had a fit, no penalty. And it does that about, for, let's say, about 170 of you. And I would guess there'll be about <laughs> 10 of you who will get affected by this little glitch, this little unreliability of IT. The bibliography, the list of your sources that you have cited for this article and this article alone of all of your academic writing can be in two parts. The first part are all the text sources and the second section can be for any images, pictures, graphs that you want to uh, put in there and cite. Normally, you put the whole lot together as a single list of sources in the appropriate alphabetical source or uh, sequence. It just so it makes it easier for me briefly to identify whether you have properly cited and referenced each of your images that you want to include. Now, I would advise you not to put too many pictures and images in there because it's going to eat up your three pages very, very quickly. There is a, a, proposed, uh, a proposed structure, four sections, an introduction which sets the context, I guess no more than about ten lines to say why, why you're addressing this, what it's about, why you've chosen it. Then there is a critical evaluation of the changes in the technology over the last 25 years, from nothing maybe to wherever we are, or from telegraph, telegrams, embryonic emails for communication through to all the things we've got now. So a critical evaluation of the changes in technology over the 25 years or so, and a critical evaluation of the impact of those changes on us. What's it done to us? Why has it done that to us? And then your final section, which shouldn't be, again, shouldn't be terribly long, no more than a paragraph, no more than about five, about ten lines at the most. Your conclusion, which is pulling together the strands of your analysis in those previous two sections, the critical evaluation of changes, in technology and the critical evaluation of the impact to identify fundamentally, having said all of this, done all this analysis, then the impact on government, on business, on society is this. That's what we're trying to come up with. Now the assessment criteria, the three criteria, and I'll show you the rubric in a minute. One is on presentation, and 20% of your grade comes from perfect adherence to the Springer LNCS template and other academic criteria like your citing and referencing the adequacy and accuracy by which you have done that citing and the way that you have constructed the references in the bibliography according to the standards that you have been learning using Plato. Plato tells you everything you need to know about building your references and then citing those references as evidence that this is where I found it, this is what I found, this is what it said. 
Being able to use those templates and write effectively, accurately, using all the aspects of the template and using your spell checker, your grammar checker in Word or whatever word process you're using to make sure that there are no spelling mistakes. You've chosen the right spelling of the word there, T-H-E-I-R or T-H-E-R-E, -E, according to whether it's ownership or place. And I would expect out of a room this large, probably there are going to be a number of you who get that reliably incorrect. And you T-H-E-R-E -E for ownership and T-H-E-I-R for place, which is wrong. But it happens every year. And so you can't totally rely on the spell checkers. Because T-H-E-R-E -E and T-H-E-I-R are valid spellings of a word that sounds like there. And there are lots of homonyms, as these same sounding words are called, where the spell checker won't necessarily give you the right advice. So you're going to have to le learn to be good at your um, proofreading. It's all about employability, that first section, the presentation section. That's why we're giving you 20%. Because it's really, really important for getting a job. The second part is the context. What is important about the topic that you have chosen? Why is it of interest to other people? Why does it have a big impact? And then the third part is the actual content. Your actual analysis in those two sections about critical comparison of the changes in technology and the critical review of the impact. And then the conclusion. You're trying to make it interesting as well as well researched and logical. It become, your article will become more and more interesting the more different ideas that you include from different sources. Because on almost everything you write, there are going to be people who say this and that and the other. And so a well researched piece of work will cover all three or four, or five different perspectives. The grid I'm going to show you will show you how I'm going to mark it, and um, Amanda as well, She'll, she will mark half, I will mark half. But I'm also going to show you how you can use that assessment grid to calibrate the topic that you want to write about. Rubrics, the marking schemes, don't just tell you how we are going to mark it. They also tell you often how to think about choosing the right topic and the right approach to have a chance of getting a really high mark. So I'm going to take you through a bit of that in a minute. You must provide citations and references in the bibliography. If you don't, if there are no citations and no references, we will cap your mark at 35%. That means you will have to redo it in the six or seven weeks after the middle of January or end of January. So you don't really want to do that. It, would, well, it says you are required to fill in the, your own self-assessment based on the rubric, because that will help you write it this first six weeks of, the t of your work here at the university to begin to work out how good you are, how good you are at understanding the assessment criteria and how you actually write in relation to that. It's a good idea to do it. You will be getting formative feedback, that is, talking to you and getting advice that says, yeah, it's a good idea, or have you thought about this? How would you like to develop your ideas in this direction? Uh, and you can rely on asking me and anyone else around about ideas, because we are pretty sort of well connected with, what, with what's going on. So we know quite a lot that's happening, so we'll be able to help you extend your ideas. So some of the ideas are, okay, but what if you do this? Ooh. 
like that one, and then you rush off in that direction and find there's lots and lots of fun stuff that makes the article really interesting. So you'll find that most of your assignments will have a rubric, a marking scheme <coughs> uh, given to you that shows how the different elements are marked, the weighting between the different elements, and the criteria. So three columns, of, each of those is effectively marked out of a hundred. Let's have a look at the presentation column first. On this column you start off with 100% and the column beneath it shows you how you can lose marks hand over fist, if you're careless. As an, an a side comment, those articles which are marked at 60% or better have the opportunity of being e -edit or edit edited together by one or two volunteers into an e-book, which will then go up on our website. And these deductions that you'll see over the next three pages are some reflection of the amount of effort that the editor or editors will have to go to to actually fix your article to a presentable style, uh, standard. So, at the top, on the, top page, on the front page, you have the title, subtitle, and various elements of the attribution, that is, who you are, your name, your, your uh, institution, your email address, and so on. There's about six lines there, and they have a separate formatting button for each one of them. You lose 5% of 100% for that column for each of those elements which are incorrect and formatted. If you get the heading styles, which are done with the buttons H1, H2, H3 in the Springer LMCS uh, section. If they don't work properly, they've lost the numbers, or they've got the wrong font, or they've got the wrong size, then you lose 5% for each of the headings which don't work properly. Maximum 15% deduction. If you Get your proofreading wrong, so syntax, grammar, spelling, anything from no, no deduction through to about 20%. Which equate, if you get the maximum deduction here of 20%, that's equivalent to four marks on the overall article grade. If you don't have more, if you have more than one citation but not enough, then you're going to start losing um, citation points. If your citations are incorrect, overall you can lose up to 20% there. The same goes with Harvard formatting of your references, you can lose 20% there. If you don't use the correct uh, normal text <coughs> button and get that right, you can lose 15% there. That's the wrong font. I mean, sometimes people will end up with Arial or some bizarre, horrible font by accident, and that which looks lousy, and that's Obviously, you've not used it, or you've broken the template. And I'll talk more about that tomorrow. If you're, the article between the, word, the introduction and the last word of the conclusion is more than three pages by any amount, other than a turnip and failure, or, ten, or less than, or more than ten lines short of three pages, you lose 50% of, of that column. And if you can't be bothered to use the Springer LMCS uh, template, then you lose all 20 marks there, all 100% of it. Which is a bit of an issue, because if you're sensible, that 20% of your article grade, just for producing the three pages to the correct standards and so on, irrespective of the quality of the context or the content. Context is worth 20%, so that's that first section that explains why this problem that you're looking at, this change <coughs> of interest. 
And I'm just going to go across the top level, the 95% mark. The context demonstrates a really fantastic and outstanding foundation of knowledge. In other words, you've read widely, really widely, got lots and lots of interesting ideas, lots of interesting sources, that prove that it's a really relevant topic. Very, very, very wide range of sources. You show from the context that it's an exciting topic. You make it really interesting. So another area, for example, in cognitive is Watson Chef, where you can sort of dial into it with your Facebook, um, and I think LinkedIn profiles, and then you can say, I want, to, want you to tell me an interesting recipe based on the fact I've got some avocado pears, I've got some ham, and one or two other things. It'll then, based on the knowledge that it has, come up with an interesting recipe. I read about it, and that's kind of cool. People have come up with some really bizarre ones which have actually worked because it contains a huge amount of knowledge of food chemistry and it ingested 10,000 existing good recipes. And from that, it can come up with really neat things. And if you're in the States, you can say, well, I've got this, these things in my uh, larder and you said that, where can I go to buy that thing that I haven't got? And what I want you to do, having shown that it's exciting, to also come up with a new perspective, something that you haven't written, read about. None of your research has come up with this neat idea. So I want the novelty factor that it's not there and you've got a new perspective which hasn't existed before. Then the content at the top level. And this is the one that these two between them help to drive you to choose subjects, topics, which are capable of getting a fantastic grade. Yeah, this is how I'm going to mark it, but this is how you're going to use it to find something interesting. Why another wide range of perspectives, lots of sources. But what you're doing, what this one is doing, is talking about the clarity of your logic to demonstrate your points. How and why has the impact of the technology changes affected you or the reader, businesses, and will have the potential to actually fundamentally change society in the 21st century? And those four topic areas that are set around all are changing society and changing business in one way or another. So your challenge is to find a topic, an area which is capable of or is already changing the way that society and business operates. Whether it's cyber stalking in the field of social media, whether it is cognitive computing which is changing society, whether it's machine learning which is allowing autonomous cars to be developed, whatever. You have got an incredibly wide field to go at, folks. And I look forward to reading some really phenomenal articles that you guys are writing. Because every year, a very good proportion of you guys are going to write really fun, really fascinating very, very interesting articles. So use the criteria here as a means of choosing a topic which is really, really interesting and is capable, at least, of that top-level score. Now, your own abilities at writing may not yet allow you to actually end up at that level, but you're going to develop that capability over the next three years. That's what you're here for, is to learn how to write effectively, to communicate effectively, to tell your story. Based on the work you've done, the research, to find out what's out there. And then, having got all that evidence, and your good 
clear writing style, sell that story and the correctness of that story to your readers or your listeners. That's what we're setting you up to do here, and it's a really great exercise. Have a look, folks, in your own time at these other criteria, lower and lower and lower down. And what you will see is that each level down, each 10% level down, will move, remove one of the really high scoring phrases from the level above. Until you get down to the really sad level, like the 37% one, which is 35 to 40, 39%, a base, very basic foundation of knowledge, very limited range of sources, and it's difficult to understand your writing, your argument, what you're trying to say. And at the bottom, bottom couple of levels, 45% to 37% of the band is high, just description. So and so says this, so and so says that. To <coughs> which my response is, is, so what? Just describing a few things is not terribly academic. It shows you can find stuff, and that's about all it is, just stuff. <coughs> what we're looking for here is impact. How is it affecting the world? How is all the stuff we're here to learn about? IT, computer science, and all of the subjects in, with you guys here are changing the way the world works, the way the world behaves, the way that people work and interact. Find out a really great topic that will address that. And then sell it to me that here's great research, great analysis, and an incredibly logical and high impact conclusion. That's what the challenge is about, folks. Okay. We looked last week a little bit about researching. Read a bit, write a bit, not a good idea. Read a bit, make notes, build your working bibliography. And then plan it and then write it. And I'll set up your submission point next week so that as you start doing your writing, you can submit it to Turnitin and it will get overwritten every time until that last time you submit it and then that's it. But the idea is so you get used to using Turnitin to check that you're not copy pasting anything. And it's also checking that because something that you read is memorable, you haven't written that down directly because that's a set of words. Because sometimes, you know, a phrase is so great, it gets into our memory and we just type it out without thinking. So we can see the similarity in text as uh, in it. Yes. The first time you will get a, resp a, re um, a, a similarity index within well, as quickly as it can do it, and at this time of year, that'll probably be within about an hour. Thereafter, you have the opportunity of one submission every 24 hours. The one other thing I will say today, to save me saying it seven times tomorrow, and the following week and the week after, is don't <coughs> work inside the Springer LNCS template from the beginning work in an ordinary word document and when you want to check it out in terms of length copy paste special text only into the Springer um, doc formatted document and then format it with the buttons because it's very very easy to break the macros and the formats that sit inside uh, these templates and once you manage to break the template so for example suddenly the button that says normal text doesn't do 10 point times the Roman, but 7 point um, whatever, Helvetica or whatever that you like, it will never go back. So you'll have to kill it, recreate the format, and then reformat it with the buttons correctly. If you start editing inside, it, it gets a bit difficult. So it'll get you used to this, use an ordinary document, an ordinary normal dot dot type of word document, type in there, 
and then just hoover it up, pop it into the Springer Fort template, and then but without any formatting, never paste it into Springer with any formatting retained. That will cause havoc. <clears throat> because Springer doesn't just use the styles of heading 1, 2, and 3, it has a macro that sits <coughs> around headers 1, 2, and 3. It has a macro that sits around the normal uh, style, that does clever things with that beginning of each paragraph. So don't think that the Springer buttons are the same as the styles. They are not. They are actually complex VBA macros that you need to allow, and I'll tell you a little bit more about that uh, in a week or so's time when you need to start using the Springer template. Okay, folks, thank you very much, and I'll see you all tomorrow in your assigned sessions. Thanks very much. <coughs>